There is a long tradition of great confrontations at the Oxford Union. Tonight, that tradition is continued by Casper Weinberger and E.P. Thompson. I screwed it up, and I paid the price. The Oxford Union is an arena whose views and votes have echoed around the world. In 1933, the Union voted in favor of a resolution that this House will in no circumstances fight for its king and country. That vote is said to have excited the interest of one Adolf Hitler. Tonight's is a landmark debate a direct confrontation between a member of the Reagan administration and a leader of a European movement that is intensely critical of the United States. Nothing like this has happened before. So we will be seeing Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger facing E.P. Thompson, a writer and historian who founded the campaign for nuclear disarmament and who now devotes himself to what is generally called the European peace movement. The debate is based on this resolution. Resolved, this House believes there is no moral difference between the foreign policies of the United States and the Soviet Union. The view of the United States that is implicit in that motion is placing the Western alliance under severe strain, threatening to split it, perhaps even destroy it. Well, this is the battleground. In the tradition of the Oxford Union, Secretary Weinberger will speak from here, Mr. Thompson will speak from there, they will be face to face about six feet apart. With me is Nicholas O'Shaughnessy, a past president of the Oxford Union, which is, I believe, no small honor. Well, Oxford is a kind of miniature Hollywood, and in the hierarchy of this miniature Hollywood, the presidency is highly regarded by the students, but when you leave, it seems trivial enough. <laughs> Mr. Bull, as president of the Oxford Union, you choose the subjects for debate. How did you come to choose this one? I thought this one would be a rather fascinating fusion between the harsh sort of amoral world of international affairs and politics that you have represented by Mr. Weinberger from the White House and the Pentagon, and with him coming to Oxford, being able to join in the sort of philosophical debates that have been going on in Oxford since the Middle Ages, that's the type of fusion that I think makes for a really interesting debate. We've had quite a few debates this term examining various issues that are important to the left in this country and abroad. And perhaps as a consequence of that, we've also had um, quite a few of these motions actually passed. So a few weeks ago, for example, the society voted in favor of unilateral nuclear disarmament. And then only a couple of weeks ago, we had a vote in favor of Marxism. In Europe, President Reagan's view of the Soviet Union has aroused some apprehension. The truth is that a freeze now would be a very dangerous fraud, for that is merely the illusion of peace. The reality is that we must find peace through strength. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. Well, yes, yes. As much as yeah. Tonight, for the first time, the broad European peace movement directly confronts the United States administration. It is also the first time a sitting Secretary of Defense has spoken in this chamber. The Defense Department <laughs> press office was not enthusiastic. Well, I don't think you come here to murder any of us. Well, I had no such an initial intention. <laughs> worried about the Union's recent well, left-wing votes and violent violent possible violent interruptions and heckling. If Casper Weinberger's performance at congressional hearings is anything to go by, we can expect him to be cool, lawyer-like, and very, very dogged. E.P. Thompson is the most commanding figure in the European peace movement. And, I might add, he's regarded as its most revered messiah. The Greenham common women, who actually exclude men from their ranks, are an embodiment of E.P. Thompson's views. They've been the front line of the British peace movement. 
Repeatedly, they've laid siege to the United States Air Base at Greenham Common, where cruise missiles have been stationed since late 1983. Defending America tonight are three of its most eloquent student speakers, Lawrence Grafstein, Christopher Kaiser, and Richard Sumner. Well, we see that the British have marshaled quite a forceful team on their side. They're determined to avenge Yorktown, and this team consists of three of Oxford's most popular student speakers, and they are Andrew Sullivan, J.R. Wilson, and Geoffrey O'Brien, who is reputed to be something of a character. I, I, I am pro-Cruise, I'm pro-America, I'm pro-NATO, um, I believe in the Atlantic Alliance, um, I believe in the, the deterrence and defence strategy, but I cannot believe the kind of cant and moral claptrap that is paraded by people like Weinberger and Reagan. It just, uh, just won't wash. Andrew is a Tory, a Thatcherite. He's on the far right of the political spectrum. E.P. Thompson, as no doubt you know, is on the far left of the political spectrum, the far left of the Labour Party. It's going to be extremely hard for me to try and uh, answer both of their lines of argument in, in one seven-minute speech and try to put forward a positive case of my own. As the first speaker for the opposition, I think you have to try to set out an argument that your side will follow. No, Andrew and I agree on very few things, <laughs> I think. And that's why this debate was very interesting, that we actually work through it without any conflict. I know Richard um, from Princeton has done a lot of this, this sort of debating, and I've gotten a chance to do some of it against Oxford, against Edinburgh when they came over. And I think we're going to try as much as we can to, to adapt our style to, to British style debating. That's not very good. It may just be like sending our best people down. This is the Gladstone room. Uh, we, we have most of our rooms named after ex-officers. And then we'll be having dinner in the Macmillan room. Nice. You are yourself a Marxist, as I understand it. Is, is this a matter of some significance in the, in the affairs of the Union? Well, I, I think it does give a political colouring to the events of the term. And I think it also has an effect upon the type of speakers that we get. We've had many distinguished Marxist intellectuals this term, of which, of course, uh, Professor Thompson is uh, one of the most noted. Now, does this, if I may ask the question, make any difference to you personally? Does it affect your life that you are, by your own definition, a Marxist? I don't, I don't think that it affects my life here directly. I certainly imagine that after Oxford, where it's rather difficult to be a fully-fledged, hard-bitten Marxist. Uh, after Oxford, I'm sure that it will affect my life very greatly because it affects the type of career that you can go into, that sort of thing. Is your view of these matters widely held nowadays, do you think, at Oxford? Less so than it would have been in the 1930s or the 1950s. In common with sort of the rest of England and the rest of Europe, we've been going through a sort of new right phase in Oxford, which happily I think we're finally growing out of. Uh, how did you come to be elected during a new right phase? <laughs> I think this was uh, some sort of appalling mistake. <laughs> I, I was elected, ironically enough, by um, the type of um, elitist um, plutocratic elements in Oxford that uh, are usually unwilling to even look at or even support anyone on the left. But I think they thought that I was so extreme that I couldn't be taken sufficiently seriously to do any harm. And so uh, I was elected, in fact, by the most uh, conservative and upper-class elements in the university. Benedictus benedicat per Jesum Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen. <laughs> Word of Secretary Weinberger's visit got out, and so did the demonstrators. Cruise missiles are located only 40 miles from Oxford. Both my father and my mother are doctors, and before that, um, we come from sort of working class peasant stock. Um, both of my grandfathers were at various times cobblers and street salesmen. Do you. Uh harbor resentment then against what might be described as the British establishment? Oh yes, enormous resentment. And which you propose to uh, work off how? I, I'm busy trying to work it off by beating them at their own game at the moment. 
and that's why I'm president of this place. Order, order. I call upon the secretary to read the minutes of the last public business meeting. Mr. President, sir, honourable members, and for those of you watching at home, hello, good evening and welcome. <laughs> I'm afraid tonight I'm a little hoarse after losing my voice over the weekend, but I'll do my best. Here are the minutes of the fifth debate of Hillary term 1984. The emergency debate was that this house would rather be dead than French. <laughs> Mr. It gives me particular pleasure to welcome to this debate the ex-president from Lady Margaret Hall, Miss Benazir Bhutto. Yeah. Benazir Bhutto is one of only six female presidents of the Oxford Union, and she is, of course, the daughter of the executed former Prime Minister of Pakistan, and only weeks ago she was released from several years of house arrest. The motion before the House is that there is no moral difference between the foreign policies of the USA and the USSR. It therefore gives me great pleasure to call upon Mr. Andrew Sullivan, the ex-president from Maudlin, to propose the motion standing in his name. And if we do talk about morality in foreign policy, we should talk about it in one sense only, and that is when you're killing, murdering or torturing people throughout the world. That's the only sense in which morality makes sense in this debate. Mr. President, honourable members, honoured guests, Mr. Weinberger can and will, because presumably it's his only option, will defend the killing of people and even the use of nuclear weapons, not by reasons of interest or tactics or diplomacy or realpolitik, but by moral reasons. He will defend immorality morally. Let me give you the argument. We in America represent freedom and democracy. The Soviet Union represents tyranny and evil. It is not just our right, but our obligation to promote that freedom and defeat that tyranny. And it's only realistic to use the same methods that evil uses. Otherwise, we will betray good. I know this argument. I've used it several times myself. <laughs> it's a good argument. It's so good that even Mr. Andropov uses it. <laughs> we in the Soviet Union represent freedom and democracy. We, the, the United States represents tyranny and evil. It is not just our right, but our moral obligation to promote that freedom, etc., etc. Let's not forget that the greatest crimes of human history have been committed by those who claim the moral sanction of ideology. The freedom has been shrieked by evil men as well as good. I believe, Mr. Weinberger, that the lesson of this century is that morality is not to be found in any ideology, be it yours or be it mine. That humanity's interest lies, in the triumph of your, lies not in the triumph of your ideology, but in the defeat of them all, and the rescuing of the word morality from the abuse into which it has fallen. We that are young can see what morality really means. This motion must be carried. I thank the Honourable Ex-President from Maudlin very much indeed for that speech. I would remind the Honourable Speakers that they should take some note of the time cards or else they will be cut down in their prime. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to call upon Mr. Lawrence Grafstein from Balliol the Librarian to oppose the motion. One thing that I want to try to show in my speech is that E.P. Thompson is utopian in a sense. I mean, he claims to be speaking for the realists. 
He claims to be speaking from the prudential standpoint, but I want to try and at least take issue with that. Thompson and my friend, the ex-president from Maudlin. As E.P. Thompson has made clear in his many eloquent writings, he would do away with the nuclear button. And as Mr. Sullivan implied at points in his speech, under the right circumstances, he just might push it. So America and the Soviet Union may both seek to dominate the world, but they seek domination with a fundamental moral difference. America can accept democracy, diversity, debate, Mr. Sullivan. The Soviet Union cannot. America can accept the existence of different moralities. The Soviet Union cannot. America can admit doubts and mistakes. The Soviet Union cannot. And we will hear a lot of analogies tonight, I fear, from the other side of the house, comparing American and Russian behavior in an effort to show that they amount to Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Indeed, analogy has replaced analysis. A few years ago, during the rise of solidarity, we were told that El Salvador was America's Poland. A bit later, El Salvador magically transformed itself into Vietnam. The Lebanon has also recently become Vietnam. Grenada, however, has not managed to transform itself into Vietnam because it was relatively easy. Grenada has instead become America's Afghanistan, even though Afghanistan was once supposed to be Russia's Vietnam because it was relatively hard. <laughs> must remember tonight that the moral pedigree of America is not peculiar to America. In the 17th century, John Locke, a student at this university, developed the classic defense of tolerance. In the 18th century, Edmund Burke made the classic case for representative democracy. In the 19th century, John Stuart Mill made a passionate plea for individual and cultural diversity. So in this troubled 20th century, Mr. President, honorable members, we say to you, stand up for what you believe in. Stand up for the right of others to stand up for what they believe in. Stand up for democracy, stand up for debate. I beg to oppose the motion. Against the motion has now been made by Lawrence Strathstein, a Canadian student here at Oxford, formerly a student at Harvard, son of a member of the Canadian Senate, himself interested in going into politics, and to judge by the applause with which he was greeted, the clear winner of round one in this debate. Wilson of St. Anthony's to speak third and in favor of the motion. Mr. President, well, I think the debate is now very members, much in the American corner. Guests, that was an extremely Mr. persuasive Weinberg. case, argued with much eloquence by Charles Lawrence Grafstein, and the sympathies of our Charles House are now clearly with the American the side as the result of a telling and powerful speech. Morals are about motivations and consequences. And in the context of foreign policy, this is especially so. Morality, by, very, by its definition, involves choice the choice between self-interest and other interest. There is a dangerous heresy which leads us to believe that our survival, our very lives, depend on one or the other of the superpowers. We call them superpowers in deference to their top dog mentality. But who are they? Two ossified gerontocracies who hold us, who hold us in mortal fear under the protection of their nuclear umbrellas telling us that we need them while we get dragged into their proxy wars being fought across the globe. Honorable members, let us show these two charlatans that we can do without them. Let us show them that we can do bloody well without them. I urge you to support this motion. if you will, a visitor from another planet hovering over Europe, looking down at the SS-20s and the Pershings. Now, I suppose that they could not discern any moral difference between those nuclear weapons pointed at each other. Suppose that that same visitor 40 years ago were to see the weapons of Hitler and the weapons of the Allies. Again, no moral difference between the weapons. Nevertheless, there underlies just as much today as there did 40 years ago a political division beneath that military strategy. There is no Europe in the middle. 
There is no such thing as Europe in the middle. We are together. The nuclear pr problem is our problem. We must solve it together. And we can wrench from under that problem the political ideologies that have held us together. There is too great a tendency, I think, to look at moral morality as an on-off switch, to list the mistakes of the United States and the Soviet Union, to say a plague on both your houses. And that's a sort of vision that reminds one of the, the sort of the magnificent equanimity of the French law, which said that both rich and poor alike were forbidden from begging and sleeping under bridges. <laughs> Our perceptions can't be quite so inadequate to permit no finer distinctions. There's no need, I think, to make excuses for my government's mistakes, and there have been many. In the United States, as in anywhere else, foreign policy is a tool of economic and security policy. But there is, in the United States foreign policy, another creed, a sort of American creed, a support for liberal, democratic, individual, and egalitarian values. Now, we have always fallen short of reaching those goals. It's, it's what Robert Penn Warren called the burr under the saddle. And everyone in the world can see the national torment that comes to the United States when it fails to reach those goals. That's what you saw in the United States over the war in Vietnam, over the use of the CIA in covert actions. We attempt to change those things. In the United States, that sort of libertarian, egalitarian value can change foreign policy. It's possible to change. But there's much that is lousy on both sides. The world is a lousy place. It's also a crazy place. I'm 23 years old and no less than any one of you who has antipathy for the United States. I'm sick of old men dreaming up wars for young men to die in. Still, it seems to me that we do ourselves no good to deny what is good in a system which is not all good, to deny what is good in a system which can correct itself. And that is the United States. I think one political analyst in the United States put it best when he said, critics say that America is a lie because it does not reach its ideals. America is not a lie. It's a disappointment. But it's a disappointment only because it is also a hope. I beg to oppose, Mr. President. America is a disappointment, but it is a disappointment because it is also a hope. And that kind of emotional finale has done well for Mr. Kaiser in a number of debates, and he clearly received the longest applause so far tonight. Mr. President, honorable members, both Russia and America are psychologically Cambridge men. That is why. British, and I don't want to be dictated to by either Americans or Russians or anybody else. And therefore, I say to you, to paraphrase John Kennedy, all free men, wherever they may live, are members of the Oxford Union. <laughs> freedom, freedom does not know any boundaries. Wherever there is injustice, throw it out, be it in America or in Russia. Wherever there is lies, throw it out, whether it be from the KGB or from the CIA. Wherever there is lack of peace, wherever there is poverty, wherever there is misery, whoever causes it, let this nation rise up and fight to replace it. I ask of you all tonight to speak for Britain and Britain alone. That was a, a somewhat rousing speech, but it was only half serious. It was done in a familiar Oxford Union style, that of cocking a snook at the rest of the world and vaunting the eminence of Oxford itself. It was done with eccentricity. The audience found it amusing, but it can hardly be regarded as a serious contribution to this debate. You see, I am a repressed person. I have three older sisters, that means four mothers, that means repression. <laughs> Not even the kulaks under Stalin have gone through what I have gone through in my 22 years. Katrina was the eldest. She was a hegemon, but she always treated me in undeveloped and weak power as a true brother. She gave me love, 
But then there were two other sisters. The first was Barbarina. In many ways, she represented to me the Soviet Union. <laughs> she never treated her guinea pigs well. How could I have ever expected anything different? I was often treated as if I was simply a weak state to be used. I never had a choice. Then there was my sister Maria, who is the human embodiment of the United States. She was big. <laughs> she was extroverted. She was schizophrenic. And she always liked to buy things. But Mr. Speaker, in her stumbling around the household, she sometimes steps on me, sometimes beat me, but often gave me a choice. <laughs> One example has not been mentioned, Mr. Speaker, and that is of the Philippines. Mr. Speaker, I realize you may believe that they have a dictator, that things are not perfect, that it took them years of struggle to get their freedom, but they got it. Eastern Europe still begs for its. Both sides have presented their arguments. Mr. Speaker, I do see a difference. It may be subtle, but there are those states which are given a choice. The member would like me to mention the word Great Britain. Great Britain has taken its side, Mr. Speaker. It has taken its side in the organization of North, Atlantic, uh, treaty of North Atlantic States. But Mr. Speaker, they have made that choice. I hope we will continue such a policy. It was a good speech from the leading American debater, Richard Sumner. How interesting to notice that his medium tonight is essentially the British style of debate. It now gives me very great pleasure indeed to call upon Edward Thompson to speak fifth and in favor of the motion. Mr. Thompson has often been regarded as the de facto leader of the European peace movement. He is certainly its chief intellectual. He is a kind of guru figure to various anti-nuclear movements which have arisen in the United Kingdom, Germany, and many other European countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Weinberger, I also wish to express my, con my pleasure that Mr. Weinberger is here. I think this is a recognition not only of the standing of this house, but a recognition also, an understanding of the depth of concern in Europe and in this country on the issues of peace. And I welcome it also as one of those signs of the openness of the American uh, uh, communications and uh, intellectual system. Now, Mr. Weinberger will find some Europeans, many British, in an ill humor today. And he shouldn't be surprised. He is himself something of a philosopher, a rigorous thinker on questions of deterrence. In his defense report for the fiscal year, of 1984, he wrote out some of his uh, reflections. Deterrence, he said, is a dynamic effort, not a static one. And he set out a view of an entire continuum over which deterrence had to be not only effective, but constantly modernized and enhanced, linking the highest level of conventional arms to the lowest threshold of nuclear weapons a continuum in regions, a continuum in, uh, in ranges of missiles, a continuum uh, in time itself for the possibility of an extended war. It's very easy to talk about theater when you're in a games room and you're looking at a globe or a map. When you actually live inside the theater and when the polemics and the missiles are going over your head and perhaps might come onto the theater itself from the born-again Christians on one side and the stillborn Marxists on the other, then is the time to begin to watch one's uh, head. And now the first flights of these missiles owned and operated by the United States are here on our territory, and they are for our greatest security. Do we really feel more secure because Cruz and Pershing have come? No one feels more secure. Neither the Europeans, nor the Soviet people, 
nor the people of the United States, for very good reasons. First of all, the military scenario has always been absurd, I think insane. These serpent's eggs are there and more are coming. By the way, perhaps we could ask Mr. Weinberger when the next flights will come. All these serpent's eggs are now packed on a site in Britain whose location, thanks to the action of some of my fellow countrywomen and their friends from North America and Europe and elsewhere, has been rather well advertised. Even the British people know where the cruise missiles are. <laughs> I think probably the Soviet Union knows where they are. And if the evil emperor is anxious to make a preemptive strike, as we are told by some people, then all the eggs can be smashed in one basket in a perfect Pearl Harbor. It's insane. Although I would reassure Mr. Weinberger, the situation isn't quite as bad as that. Uh, we have got a fence around these missiles. In fact, we've got quite a tall fence. And we've now got three fences. And we've got them encircled, pretty well encircled, by soldiers and by police, and best encircled of all by the Green and Common Women, and outside by the peace movement and the nation. And all we have to do to make them completely safe is to get the police to turn around and face the other way. <laughs> I remember saying at a meeting in Comiso in Sicily, 18 months ago, we've been saying this up and down Europe, that the dragon's teeth sown in Comiso and Greenham Common would spring up as armed missiles on the other side. And so it has taken place. Any child could see that. Any child. Why can... <coughs> eminent statespersons not understand what Auden wrote in agony at the commencement of World War II. I and the public know what all school children learn, those to whom evil is done do evil in return. And I put as central to my case two documents. Don't worry, I'm not going to read them, I'm just going to show them to you. And these were part of the propaganda which led up to this disastrous situation. One is called Soviet Military Power, and it has a foreword by Mr. Weinberger, and it is a Sears Roebuck catalogue of all the deadly military equipment, whether naval or air or ground, uh, possessed by the Soviet Union and its rate of development. And the other, which was produced in answer to it, is called Whence the Threat to Peace. I don't know what the analogy for Sears Roebuck is in the, in the Soviet Union, but it is a Sears Roebuck catalogue, rather better illustrated, because they could get the illustrations more easily from the United States press, of all the barbarous military equipment being developed in the United States. Uh, they've even copied each other in maps. I don't know if you can see, but here is a power projection in the United States catalogue with a huge Soviet Union, Mr. President, a huge Soviet Union, <laughs> uh, with arrows, arrows going in every direction around the world. And in the Sears Robert catalogue from the Soviet Union there, uh, of America, Soviet Union is rather smaller, all the arrows are attacked. all the arrows are attacked. Bind these two together, and they make the most evil book, the most evil book known in the whole human record. We know now that through last autumn, this power lay in the hands of two elderly men, one of whom was on a kidney machine and half dead from the neck down, and the other of whom, in the view of his critics, was on an autocue machine and half dead from the neck up. <laughs> autocue machine, that is to say, a telephone. Yeah. 
There is now a formidable United States presence everywhere, everywhere. Oman, Turkey, Iceland, South Korea, Egypt, Diego Garcia. What are they doing at Diego Garcia, Somalia? What are you doing there? What moral interest is here? If anything, I would say, of the two, the United States administration under President Reagan has been more threatening in its military posture. But the Soviet has been more responsible for the ideological and security blockages which prevent any healing process in the world to begin. But no micrometer can find a moral difference in the postures of hostility. And I want to ask, and I want to ask when Mr. Weinberg is here, what is this quarrel about? It is an irrational condition. It consists in itself. The superpowers feel threatened because they are threats to each other and have historically become so. It is an inquired inertia. It is a self-reproducing system. When at a certain historical moment, at the end of World War II, the armies met and caused a divide like a geological fault across the center of our continent. You then had, as a product of those particular historical circumstances and contingencies, the origin of the Cold War. You can look back there for moral differences. But now, after 35 years, there is no more morality. Each side pretends to moral superiority. The, U U the Soviet Union pretends to be a socialist heartland, but it fears most of all democratic socialist impulses. Hence Prague, the crushing of the Prague Spring in 68. Hence the crushing of the self-activating working class movement of Solidarność in Poland. And I want to say it is you it is the Western military posture which repeatedly gives to the old post-Stalinist rulers an extended historical tenure. It is the evil empire claptrap, the sworn enemies claptrap that Mrs. Thatcher was using only last year, which causes prison doors to close on the other side, which leads to the tightening of security systems which gives a justification and a legitimacy to the post-Stalinist leadership which has outlasted. With the greatest respect, sir, do you really believe that Mrs. Thatcher's voice or Mr. Reagan's voice, as shrill as we all agree they are, is responsible for the closing of prison doors in the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union? What about the Soviet aid, the moral agents who are leaders in the Kremlin or who are, who are the ones with the policies? I can't see how you could hold someone's, someone's words responsible for someone else's deed. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. I thank you if I, that, that I thank you for this correction. I said accomplices. I hope I said accomplices. I hope that that was my word. And Americans should reflect how it happened. There's never been in this century any major war on American territory, and long may and forever may that continue. But if some 40 years ago, by way of Canada, invading armies had come into New England, had sacked Boston, Providence, New Haven, Albany, Rochester, Buffalo, had gone as far west as Detroit, had invested New York so that New Yorkers died by one third of the population, et shoe leather, burnt their books and their floorboards as the Leningrad people did, had got to the borders of Washington as Hitler's armies got to uh, Moscow, had then fought block by block right into the heart of Chicago as happened to Stalingrad left 20 million dead, then the United States might have made, after that, a client buffer zone of Canada. The first moral difference, I am coming to conclusion, Mr. President, the first moral difference that will appear, <laughs> the first moral difference that will appear will be when any nation, either superpower, takes an actual act of disarmament an actual act of disarmament, then we can start to talk about morality. 
Until that happens, I rest my case on these two odious books. And I ask Oxford to support our motion in the name of a universalism at its very foundation in the Middle Ages. A universalism of scholarship which owed its duty to the skills of communication and learning and not to those of the armed state. And those skills, can be, I ask Oxford to call a conference of the universities of East and West to make its contribution to the healing process of Europe. The strongest poison ever known came from Caesar's laurel crown, as Blake wrote. I, I support this motion in the confidence that this house will reject the poison of Caesar. A rousing speech, as you can hear from the applause. Mr. Thompson warned Secretary Weinberger that Europe was, as he put it, meditating a declaration of independence. He said that Western Europe must make a space between the two powers. He mentioned nuclear-free zones as something that would be desirable. He said that there would be a true moral difference between the United States and the Soviet Union when one power or the other took an act of disarmament. The President will now call, the President of the Union will now call on Secretary Weinberger. It is a great honor and it gives me very great pleasure to introduce to this society Caspar Weinberger, U.S. Secretary of Defense, to speak six and against this motion. President, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor indeed to have the opportunity to be here tonight and to participate in this debate, and I have welcomed the opportunity and look forward to it for a long time. I was warned that one of the greatest perils that I faced here tonight was the unremitting and uh, preternatural chill of this building. Uh, <laughs> you have, um, in a very friendly way, eliminated that uh, threat, threat uh, and uh, given us a uh, nice warm television studio uh, in which to uh, discuss these critically important matters. It does seem to me that if we are to debate the uh, moralities of the two systems, uh, we should look at uh, Soviet definitions and our definitions. The Soviet definition has always been that moral policy is what advances the Soviet state. That moral policy is what is, uh, uh, helps the cause of communism. Brezhnev said it many times, and indeed it is part of the, uh, it is part of the litany. It is a moral system which turns the definition of the word moral upside down as far as we are concerned. Our view of morality is basically that policy is moral if it advances certain basic principles and rights, something that we uh, mentioned to you in a letter that we sent about 200 years ago, and which says that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When I have the privilege of visiting uh, our forces in various parts of the world, uh, I'm struck, first of all, by their uh, enormous uh, morale in which they feel they are doing something worthwhile, not just for themselves, but for others. Uh, mostly that's because of the others in the areas where they serve have made them feel uh, enormously welcome. I particularly noted uh, an example at the Fulda Gap, which divides uh, uh, East and West Germany, as you know. And here our observation towers face East, uh, because it is essential, we feel, uh, that we be apprised of any kind of movement toward the line that would uh, indicate uh, an interference with a basic uh, mission that not just the United States, but which NATO has, of trying to protect the freedoms of the people in West Germany. But the observation towers on the other side face East, too. And they face East for a very different reason. They face East to contain and keep in and prevent anyone coming to the West. I think it's a, uh, 
highly moral act when we uh, emerged from World War II with total and complete military supremacy and with a monopoly of the nuclear weapons. And we did not use this to blackmail the world. We did not use this to secure domination. Instead, we proposed through the Baruch plan to uh, offer this uh, uh, system of nuclear weapons uh, uh, to the world in order that it could be dismantled. Uh, and we uh, offered uh, to ensure that we would not only give up these nuclear weapons, but then when that uh, was not accepted, what we did was then to uh, try to help rebuild the economies of our allies and our former enemies. Not a morality which touched on whether or not it helped the United States. Not a morality untouched on whether or not it advanced the cause of communism, but a morality based on we, what we thought was the right thing to do in helping to advance the basic principles under which our country was founded. Now, who among the Soviets voted that they should invade Afghanistan? Maybe one, maybe five men in the Kremlin. Who has the ability to change that and bring them home? Maybe one, maybe five men in the Kremlin. Nobody else. And that is, I think, the height of immorality. Because it means that no matter what faint glimmerings of public opinion may sometimes stir in the Soviet Union, as they have stirred uh, rather vigorously uh, in Poland, would be not tolerated, would be stamped out, and uh, that that would be uh, not only the end of the glimmerings, but the end of the people who, who raised it. So, so the ability of the people... Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have rightly condemned the puppet state controlled by the Soviet Union. But is it not true that your country also controls, in, for example, the whole of Latin America, many corrupt and puppet governments? And surely the question we are asking you to address yourself tonight to all is what is the difference in any, and I suspect there is no difference, as do many, many people in this country, what is the difference between your puppet regimes and the puppet regimes of the Soviet Union? The um, difference is very clear. American support of any regime, puppet or otherwise, can be changed and can be changed overnight by the vote of our Congress, by the vote of our people, uh, and uh, whatever support was given to whatever regime must cease. And that cannot be done in the Soviet Union. It is important to pair out, that to, to bear in mind, that whether or not you do have agreement with our courses in, uh, in uh, Latin America, and bear in mind that uh, what we are seeking in, in uh, Central America uh, is enormous uh, economic assistance that can uh, enable those countries to rid themselves of the terrible poverty that has made them such an inviting target for communism of the uh, Libyan and Cuban uh, uh, character, uh, that uh, it is essential to give the people uh, an opportunity to exercise their own judgment and their own will. But if our people disapprove of it, if our people think that we are making the error that you think we are making, something can be done about it. And that cannot be done in the Soviet Union. And that, I think, is a significant difference uh, in morality. The ability of people to participate in and control their own, uh, their own government and their own foreign policy is, I think, the highest form of morality. Yes, sir. Please excuse me for intervention. Do you think that an immoral act becomes less immoral because we have the choice to do it or not? And do the people... And do the people who are tortured and killed and terrorized by those regimes think it is a more moral act because Congress approves of it and not some general? The point is, the point is that whether you think it is moral or not, or whether anyone else thinks it is moral or not, it is capable of being stopped and changed by the will of the people. And that cannot be done in the Soviet Union. You have locked in uh, acts which may or may not be considered to be immoral by others, but nothing can be done about them. And in our country and under our system, uh, it is possible to make those changes.
I'd like to discuss just a moment here a couple of the things that, uh, I'll give away just a moment, uh, a couple of the things that Mr. Thompson uh, raised. He said that uh, we aren't really discussing how it would be for people to live in the Soviet Union, and we aren't really discussing internal conditions in the Soviet Union. It seems to me we are, we have to be, because it is those conditions which give rise to a foreign policy uh, and give rise to the ability to judge the moralities of that policy. There are some of the ways you judge it, and if it cannot be changed, it cannot possibly be considered moral. Deterrence, he said, in the United States, uh, as I gathered it, with some kind of uh, substantial criticism, uh, is a dynamic concept and keeps changing. Indeed, it has to, because deterrence is a very difficult equation by which we try to get inside the Soviet mind and find out what it is would deter the Soviet Union from making an attack. Now, sir, you had a question. Perhaps I will still make the point, despite the fact that it's rather old now. You talked about uh, the American people having a choice. The American people having the choice that if they didn't like the foreign policy of your government, they could do something about it, they could put you out of office. That assumes, sir, that they know what's going on. That assumes, in the case of Nixon and Vietnam, that they knew how many people were dying. That assumes that they knew the reasons for the Americans being in Vietnam and they knew what was going on. They didn't, sir, and your system perhaps is based upon deceit as much as it is anything else. But on the contrary, on the contrary, they did know what was going on. Uh, they did put an end to it. Uh, and they put an end to it uh, precisely when it was concluded by the majority of the American people that this was a, a, uh, an enterprise in which they felt they should no longer engage. And uh, they did end it, and they ended it very quickly. Why have the cruise missiles come to Britain? Why have the Pershings come to Germany? For a very good reason. Because the NATO organization to which we all belong unanimously asked to have them, in 1979 and repeated it time after time after time. I've gone to, I guess, four meetings of NATO a year, and there is never a time during the three years that I've been attending those meetings that there hasn't been an effort made to cancel, change, revise, amend, repeal, in some way, uh, end the 1979 dual track resolution, and they all failed. Three countries where the missiles are to be deployed or are being deployed have voted on this within the last year. Britain, Germany, and Italy. So uh, I think what we're talking about here, and uh, Mr. Thompson again said in his very eloquent talk, what is this quarrel all about? It's really very simple. The quarrel is all about freedom, individual, human, personal freedom, and whether or not we are to be allowed to exercise it, our children, our, our descendants for many generations, as you and I have for all of our lives, or whether or not that's to be blocked by the imposition of a system that without any deterrence, without any troops, without any military preparations, would hardly be much interested in respecting a proposal that the fractured part of Europe, East and West, uh, come together, uh, draw into itself, and ask, please, to be let alone from nuclear weapon. That's what it's all about. It's about personal freedom. And I rest my case on your liberty to walk out either door, not have anything happen thereafter, have no intimidation, no threats, no arrests. And I asked you to consider whether in the other system, you and your families could have been here, or if you felt it was safe to your family to come here tonight and express the things on either side, the things I'm saying, the things Mr. Thompson has said so eloquently, or many others, if you think that was a, uh, that is a system. So I urge your uh, opposition to this motion so that you can come again. Secretary Weinberger's speech has ended. Quiet, good-humored, and evidently well-received speech from the Oxford Union. Nicholas O'Shaughnessy, the speakers have left. The next act is the voting, mm -hmm. I take it. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and the voting is done how? Well, you'll notice that as each student goes through the door, they actually go through one side of the door or the other, and in that act, they vote. Given the fact that uh, Secretary Weinberger did come to the Oxford Union, and that uh, there was a school of thought that he would be eaten alive by E.P. Thompson, how do you think he made out? I think he was, to some extent, thrown out of gear by those interruptions, but generally speaking, it was a fairly 
good performance and one which I think won a certain amount of respect here in this house tonight. The president now returns to the throne to give the final result of the vote. There being 232 votes in favor of the motion and 271 votes against the motion and three abstentions, I declare the motion to have been defeated. The House is adjourned. So this great confrontation has ended. It may be that some of Mr. Weinberger's points were lost or minimized by his low-key delivery, but the motion that there is no moral difference between the foreign policies of the Soviet Union and the United States has been defeated by 271 votes to 232, a margin of 39. For the two of us, Nicholas O'Shaughnessy and Edwin Newman, good night from the Oxford Union.